a gravel road and some cows and a windmill out in front. And there was a few devotees that came over after that. And Govinda Dasi came and Sudama Maharaj came when Prabhupada came. So he was there just for maybe a week. And that was the beginning of the Hawaii Yatra. Was he there for I don't know because when I came, it was, I believe, April. Probably was only there for a week or a week and a half, perhaps. I heard it was there for the last season. Well, Govinda was the one that would know the details. When I came, I was like a hippie. <laughs> and by some circumstance, I went to the temple. I found a little notice on a bakery window when I was looking for God and I had just prayed that God send me somebody who knew him and then I saw the bakery window um, little brochure or pamphlet and I went to the address and Prabhupada was the only one there he answered the door and told us to come up so uh, the devotees had been out on a hari nam so that was, that was the first beginning and the first time I'm in Hawaii and uh, I was coming back every day for about a week and then Srila Prabhupada left and everybody else left. Balabhadra had come the month before and Turidas came the month after and it was just the five of us. Um, there was a beach like a little peninsula. I, I don't know exactly. Maybe it was Sunset Beach. I have a picture actually. Um, they picked me up on the way, and Srila Prabhupada was an old red pickup truck. Srila Prabhupada I rode in the front with Govinda and uh, Gursindar. And there was a few other people in the back, and we went and had a, a little party now. The second one, during that week. And that's where Kasalya came from. I saw you came back to the temple with myself, and uh, we sat in Prabhupada's room, and he asked her who she was and you know where she had come from, and she asked him about Timothy Berry and such. So we were there for, I don't know, maybe six months, eight months, and then we moved to uh, a newer place on Sunset Beach, and Siddha was right down the way. And we would go and chant on the beach. This one dog would come all the time. It was Turida, Singobinda, Gursinder, Balabhadra, and myself. And they would, the guys would hitchhike into town uh, in the daytime, and I would just like do whatever. We did The altars were just like a picture of Gordon Tai. And then after that, we moved to town. We moved to Honeywell Street. And we've been there before on our tour. So we were there for, I don't know, a year or something? That's where you came, right? Yes. So there was different people coming from the university and things were starting to go a little. We had crater festivals and we were starting to preach and we were in town now. So things were getting a little more exciting. People started coming. That's where Bafaru, uh, Ashram Maharaj, and who she came from, Overdon came, I don't remember who else came. We came from May 1st to the Jimi Hendrix concert. Oh, that was at the, the wasn't that out of the Kapiolani bandstand? It was at the White Oh, it was the Shell. But we had gone to, to, to the auditorium. It was the so we weren't on on uh, Honeywell yet. No, uh, you guys were still out at the North Shore. Out at Sunset Beach. Wow. Anyway, so we were on Honeywell for a while, and then we bought a temple. Gurusendra had so many. Balabhadra had so many. Or Govinda had so many. Balabhadra had so many, and we got the McKinley Street Temple. So that's a small shadow. Now you can start. <laughs> yeah, I can, you know, I'm not going to start. Just, you know, I'm just um, changing, changing the microphone to uh, something that 
And what year was all this? 1969. 69, um, 69 is when I met Sheila Charles, but I don't know where And then we were on Sunset for I don't know how long. I, I was definitely not aware of time and circumstances. <laughs> and uh, it's not working. And then we went to Honeywell Street. We were there for a while. You didn't move in the temple then, though, right? I didn't move in Honeywell. Uh, I moved in just after. Is it just and I moved in just after, just after you moved to the temple. Okay. I don't see a turn on thing. You go all the way back. You join the temple. I guess the cord doesn't have to be. You met the devotees at the temple. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, taking care of five deities. It was very interesting how Srila Prabhupada did it, because first we made Gorni Thai deities, and that was a process. Srila Prabhupada taught Govinda Dasi in, uh, while doing art, and she, he explained, the deity manifests according to his own sweet will. It isn't if we're a sculptor and we're very qualified and expert, we can just sculpt the deity and the deity will come. Srila Prabhupada taught us that we had to pay our obeisances and beg the deity to appear. So, Govinda Dasi is really good with certain kinds of art, but not that much with sculpting. So I was making jokes, you know, about her proportions. So she said, then you do. And I had never sculpted before, and all of a sudden I found myself in a room with Jaitri reading to me and different persons modeling with their arms up. And I was sculpting the deity for about a month. And I wasn't allowed to do anything else, just sculpt the deity. And it was really an amazing process because I had no qualification. I was never, I never sculpted before and I never sculpted since. So all of a sudden I am a sculptor for Krishna. But that process of bowing down and begging the Lord to appear and hearing about the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya all day long, which I would be reading to me, then there was a kind of you're in Gore, you're in Gore, Lord Chaitanya consciousness. You're hearing Gorkata, that's all you're hearing, and you're um, begging the Lord to please, please appear. And sh we were so poor, we had two saris and two different color flip-flops. You know, we didn't have a proper set of shoes. But then we just, had flip-flops? We had flip-flops, that's what I hear. It's like you had flip-flops. <laughs> we were doing well to have two different color flip-flops. But the wonderful thing is we used to go door to door to, um, to preach about Krishna consciousness. And since we were so poor, um, we would ask something from them. And if they couldn't give anything, we asked them for their old newspapers. So the, the deities were made of paper mache, and they were contributed to all the people. The residents of Hawaii contributed to the making of the Panchatattva deities. <laughs> it's actually really fascinating how that happened, that so, so many people got the opportunity to do service. And then we also, we would bring some uh, margarine for buttering the molds, and whatever people grew in their yards, they would always give us something. Back in those days, there was a real um, kind of a gentle culture when you would go to the door and they would, they would listen to you and they would want to give something because the Asian uh, culture believed in monks going door to door and doing begging. So we were received by the population when it came to going door to door very nicely. So Sri Lanka, he, he managed the whole thing very carefully over the um, over letters. And when finally the two deities of Gorni Thai were completed and seven sets of clothes made, Sri Prabhupada said, now make Panchatasa. It was like a transcendental trick, you know. <laughs> and we thought, oh, well, oh, we finally got this them done. But actually, then we were worrying about, I know Jayashree was trying to find matching fabrics for the outfits because the, we only had the outfits all made, seven outfits for Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nishinanda, and all of a sudden we needed to have three more sets of clothes times seven. So. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, do we have any photographs of the original Panchatattva? And also, where do they go? Where? They, they, um, we do have some photos. They're not real good quality. But they did, um, they had gotten quite injured, so the true prophet instructed us to put them into the ocean. And how did that happen? How was that done? I was curious. Ashram Maharaj, were you part of that? That was 
from one alone. I wasn't actually. No, no, they were here. They, they came they here. They came here? Okay. They came, they were here for a while. Yeah, they're here. Uh, when we moved from, um, when we acquired this place, when Umbridge bought this place, um, the original deities came here from um, uh, Ala Aluru in Moanlo Valley. And they were here for a while. Right, they came right into this temple room yeah. here. This they were actually, they were here. No, this temple yeah. was extended. This, huh? It was, if you notice, there's a little bit of a ridge right there, so yeah, it was there. a little bit short. <laughs> so they were in this room? Yes, they were in yeah. this room. This very room. This very room. Um, I, however, um, by the time the original deities were replaced, I was living on the neighbor islands. My wife and I lived on the Pig Island for a couple of years and then on Maui for a year. So when we um, came back here from Maui in August of 77, we had new deities. <laughs> and it was a big um, surprise for us. And sometime in the late 70s, uh, my friend Brishni is part of the story. Brishni, uh, my friend Brishni was a, he was a, an MFA student in sculpture at the University of Hawaii Art School. MFA students for? Uh, Master of Fine Arts. So he was working on a master's degree in sculpture. And Govinda Dasi went over there and she was trying to recruit someone to help her figure out how to do this thing. How to make the molds. And how to make the molds and everything. And um, Brishni agreed to do it, although he thought it was just a really weird project because he was an atheist. <laughs> He's an atheist, hippie artist guy. And uh, his name was Louis Goldstein. And uh, he gradually started spending more time over at the temple um, helping with the project and then eventually he moved in and then uh, and this was 19 probably 71 late 70 early 71 and uh, so we all had long hair and those of us who had beards probably had beards I never had a beard Still on my feet. Um, but uh, then I remember when Grishni shaved up, it was like everybody almost fell over. Yes. He, there emerged this beautiful man. <laughs> Every, you know, we didn't suspect he was there because he was, Grishni was a little um, irascible. He sometimes has a, had a, showed a little attitude. So, Sometime in the late 70s, after the deeds had been replaced by the set before this, which were identical to this, Krishni and his wife came to visit the temple, and they came in to take darshan of the deities, and one of the devotees asked him, they knew who he was, but they asked him, oh, what do you think of these new deities? And Krishni just shook his head and he said, they are Baba Bharadraj beautiful. <laughs> He was, he was quite impressed. Yes. So exactly what the logistics were of re you know, replacing the deities, I think they rented a boat or something and took them out to sea. But that all happened when I was living um, on Hawaii and uh, Maui. So I don't have any details on that. I think they floated. They were paper mache. And, and there was the armature was wood. Wood, yeah. wood and thin wire, but the ankles were really thick wood to hold up. Lord Chaitanya was like this and so he, you know, they had to um, have they really thick, thick ankles. They, they had to weight them, yeah. I think they waited in there. Oh. Oh. How how big were they? About the same, same size. size. Same size. Really that big. Yes. Huge. Mm -hmm. It was, um, Rishni really liked Prashant, and so we made sure we fed it really nicely, and um, he had, a, it was a tricky task, because when Shri Prabhupada wanted more deities, 
he had to figure out, we didn't sculpt the whole new deity, but he figured out how to make Sri Adoita and um, Sri Vas with folded hands like this. So he adjusted the deity's arms, used the same deity, but adjusted the deity's arms. So he, it was amazing. We didn't really have a proper kiln or anything. We would take the, the, um, the door off the stove and put the molds in there and kind of like dry them out, dry the paper mache out. It was quite a big operation, five deities. So Krishna really worked hard, but by the end of it, he was a Vaishnava. It was fascinating how Lord Chaitanya indoctrinated him into his service and then just decided to keep him. <laughs> and then we went on to make more sets of just Gorni Thai that were sent out to so the many, beach. So many different temples. Mm -hmm. beach had a set. And we had also, Govinda had started the first Tulsi plant. She got seeds. She tried, it didn't work, she got seeds from India. She tried and they started, and we started this huge Tulsi thing, just like. And uh, Prabhupada told her she was responsible for all the Tulsi's growing movement. He told her all the prayers. He told her to make book booklets. She made a booklet, she sent seeds to all these different temples, and that's how there's Tulsi in the different temples. Yeah. Jai Shri and I did, we nurtured the little keikis, the babies, and then Ashram Maharaj, he was digging the holes for when we planted them into the ground. So, Govindadasi gave us the seeds. Remember that bed spring thing? It had every little, they were like moing. There were springs and we had a, we had a um, pot on each bed spring so that there would be air all around, and we would take yeah. each pot and put it into a, uh, we put water in a tub and water them from below. Because the seeds were so very tiny, we really didn't know what we were doing. So we were trying really hard. The first batch was didn't come up, and the second batch wasn't Tulsi, and the third batch came from Prabhupada's hand directly. And they were under, remember it was under the Amhuri um, tree in the front? It was really kind of a funny operation, but it was extremely beautiful. And the Tulsis ended up um, along the walkway, and there were they were six foot. They were huge. I've never seen any Tulsis like that. We had by the, by the time Prabhupada came, we had Tulsis that were eight inches deep. The ones down front. We had we had. Um, I planted eight um, of the large, larger tulsis down in front of the uh, the rock wall, so they were like on the easement. Well, in from the easement, they were right up against the wall, and um, we had must have had good soil there. I mean, it was mostly volcanic cinder at, at that property, and so that hole that I dug. Um, for the first Tulsi bed was um, it was quite a, it was quite a task um, because I think I dug it five feet deep or something like that probably like fifteen feet long Bob do you remember how long that was that bed the, one. the big Tulsi bed is when you went up and well we had the big Tulsi trees down in front in front of the rock wall and then you go up the steps. And we, I have, I planted roses. This is how I got to be. There we had these roses going, growing along the sidewalk. Then we had Tulsi growing behind that. And then I had this big bed with several hundred Tulsi trees um, that I had dug. And it, I don't know, probably 15, 20 feet long and six, eight feet wide or something like that. And it was volcanic cinder. So I had to dig in this volcanic cinder and haul it in five gallon buckets under <clears throat> under the house, under the, uh, what do you call it, the crawl way under the house and dump it in there. And, uh, and then I filled up the hole with compost and, and uh, manure and stuff. But we had, we had Tulsi's that were eight, eight and a half feet tall down front. Um, it was huge. Uh, huge trunks. 
When Prabhupada came to install the deities, he was um, uh, quite pleased uh, uh, with the Tulsi trees. And there were little um, kind of adventures with the devotees approaching Tulsi, or come, accompanying Prabhupada into the temple. And uh, so the Tulsis were so big, they were crowding the entrance to, up to the, the, the sidewalk. So the devotee, one night he noticed uh, some of the brahmacharis had brushed against the Tulsi trees. And Prabhupada said, the Tulsi is so elevated, so exalted. We shouldn't brush against, we shouldn't you know, bump into Tulsi. And uh, um, so then there was some back and forth about whether we could prune Tulsi so we didn't bump into her. He said, no, you can only cut Tulsi to offer her to Krishna. So there was that. And then one night, he noticed that her shadow was being cast across the sidewalk by the street light that was kind of on the corner of McKinley Street and Honeywell Street. And he said, oh, Tulsi is so exalted, we shouldn't step, even step on her shadow. So the next night, the devotees, and I have in my mind a picture of Tarun Kanti. Tarun Kanti was about six foot four, big tall, lanky guy. Tarun Kanti leaping over Tulsi's shadow. And Prabhupada chuckled and said, Tulsi is so elevated, we shouldn't step over her shadow. <laughs> And at one point, all these things, Prabhupada was, and he was, you know, that he had this wry sense of humor, so he sometimes had a little twinkle in his eye when he would say these things. And then Govinda Das, he said, we can't cut Tulsi, we can't bump into Tulsi, we can't step on her shadow, we can't step over her shadow. Shri Prabhupada, what in the world do we do? Prabhupada just smiled and said, don't live, don't die. <laughs> in other words, you're, you're yeah. between a rock and a hard spot, and that's just how it is. So, um, but you tied her, you tied her back. Yeah, so yeah we tied her back, we tied her back from the, uh, you know. So we had dumped our Tulsi. For a while, we were literally crawling underneath, you know, like we were having to sort of duck down to get into the temple, because she had overgrown so deeply. Prabhupada was quite pleased about yeah. Tulsi. And when he um, accepted me for initiation, he mentioned that in his letter. Because Gorsundra had written him, this boy is um, uh, our head Tulsi gardener here. I kind of like you know, kind of growing into that. And Radhad wrote, uh, he said, that Gorsundar writes that you are a head Tulsi gardener there. And now Krishna Tulsi is there as well. And Krish, actually, Krishna Tulsi, I think, had just come up the day the letter came. So that, we found that interesting. But um, and he said, uh, certainly, you must be a great devotee. And then later in the letter, he said, so chant um, at least 16 rounds every day, go out for street some kirtan as much as possible. And by the grace of Srimati Tulsi Devi, you'll make rapid advancement to Krishna consciousness. Yeah. Now we're going to have some beautiful music. Lord Chaitanya's moon is rising, among some other beautiful songs. Uh, Trini and Yuri our godmother and god sister, old time Hawaii devotees. Sorry we didn't hear from everyone. There's, we should maybe get together and do something like this where we just all talk about Prabhupada and ask questions. And